we're so glad you're here. Good morning, grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We are so glad that you chose to worship with us at Wrightsville United Methodist Church this morning. A few brief announcements before we get started with our worship service. First of all, Children's Sunday School starts back this week and we're having it at two different hours. So you can join us throughout the summer at either 815 or 1030. Um, you can contact Christina Norville, our Director of Children and Youth, at 412, you have to spell that out, F-O-U-R-T-W-E-L-V-E, -E, at wrightsvilleumc.org in order to find out more about that. Also, Vacation Bible School starts this week. That means tomorrow, Vacation Bible School starts. Can you believe we're already at Vacation Bible School? Uh, so exciting. Again, Talk to Christina Norville at 412 at rightsvilleumc.org if you have any questions. Throughout the month of June, we're doing a food drive for Nourish NC. Nourish NC collects food for needy families right here in the Wilmington area. And so some of the things that we're looking for this week include peanut butter and jelly, boxes of cereal. Um, we also are looking for pasta and canned meat, including canned chicken, canned tuna, um, those types of foods. You can bring them to the food bins that are located underneath the fellowship hall anytime during the week, and we'll make sure that they get to nourish. So thanks so much for that. If you're looking for a Bible study this summer, Monday Night Lights might be the place for you. Monday Night Lights is a group of women that meet each Monday evening. And if you'd like to find out more about that particular Bible study, contact Donna Pinckney at Donna at RightsvilleUMC.org. And we have really enjoyed the worship experience that is Worship on the Water. It originally started as Sundays at 6. It's now been moved outside to Worship on the Water but it's gonna be drawing to a close next Sunday. So you can come and experience Worship on the Water for the very last time next week with Pastor Christina. There's, we're gonna have Holy Communion and a celebration of that mighty ministry that has taken place over the last three years. Well, that's all the announcements I have for today. So let's prepare our hearts and minds to continue to worship the Lord our God. Let us bow our heads for our opening prayer. Almighty God, your word bursts forth into our lives like a glorious sunrise. You speak and our hearts rejoice. You command and our eyes are opened. The sound of your voice brings revival to our souls. Your words are purer than the finest gold. True and righteous one, living word, light our way today and always through the power of the Spirit and in the name of your Son, Jesus the Christ. Amen.
my name is Abigail Richardson and I am a member of the graduating class of 2021 and today I will be reading Psalm 138. I will praise you, O Lord, with all my heart. Before the gods I will sing your praise. I will bow down towards your holy temple and will praise your name for your love and your faithfulness, for you have exalted above all things. Your name and your word, when I called, you answered me. You made me bold and stooth-hearted. May all the kings of the earth praise you, O Lord, when they hear the words of your mouth. May they sing of the ways of the Lord, for the glory of the Lord is great. Though the Lord is on high, he looks upon the lowly, but the proud he knows from afar. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you preserve my life. You stretch out your hand against the anger of my foes. With your right hand, you save me. The Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. Your love, O Lord, endures forever. Do not abandon the works of your hands. Precious Lord, Take my hand, lead me on, let me stand. I'm tired, I am weak, I am worn. Through the storm, through the night, lead me on to the light. Take my hand, precious Lord, lead me home. When my way grows drear, precious Lord, linger near. When my life is almost gone, hear my cry, hear my call, on my feet, lest I fall. Take my hand, precious Lord, lead me home. appears and the night draws near and the day is past and gone at the river I stand guide my feet hold my hand take my hand precious Lord lead me home I invite you to bring the joys of your lives and the concerns of your hearts to God this morning as we pray together our morning. Lord Jesus, word made flesh, from the beginning of creation, you named and claimed us for yourself. As we prepare to say goodbye to someone who has ministered among us with faithfulness and joy, we ask that you will look with kindness upon your servant, Christina Turner who leaves this community marked by your cross, fed by your word, filled with our care, and sent to be your presence to all she meets. Guide her on the way and bless her with your wisdom that she may be a word of hope for a world in need. For the Wrightsville United Methodist community, we ask for comfort in the absence of our friend and a renewed commitment to the vision of God's reign so that we might carry on the mighty work to which she has spurred us onward. For the Fairmont United Methodist community in Raleigh, we ask that they will receive our sister Christina with a gracious welcome, a generous spirit, and genuine care. For our dear friend and so many other friends and family members who are on our hearts this morning, we give you thanks. We ask a special blessing upon all those whom we name before you now. Just as Paul reminded the church in Philippi, may we also take heart, have faith, for the goal is in sight. May we press on to take hold of it as Christ has taken hold of us. Teach us to have no fear and continue to reach out for what lies ahead, for the prize, for the life to be found in Christ Jesus, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day thy daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. As an expression of our worship each week, we invite you to give generously to the work of the church. You can do so by writing a check and sending it in to Wrightsville United Methodist Church, Post Office Box 748, Wrightsville Beach, North Carolina, 28480. Also, you can use the Wrightsville United Methodist Church app or go on our website, which is wrightsvilleumc.org. There are many ways in which you can give in the life of the church. Some people like to just come by the church and drop off their check, and that's certainly fine as well. We invite you to give as you listen to this coming meditation.
I've got a question for everybody out there today. How many of you have lived in Wilmington or Wrightsville Beach your entire life? Raise your hand. Raise it up high so I can see. You've lived in Wilmington or Wrightsville Beach your entire life. Okay, thanks. How many of you once lived in another town? How many of you have ever lived in another state? How about another country? I've not lived in another country. You know who has? Pastor Christina has. Pastor Christina used to live all the way in China on the whole other side of the world. Isn't that amazing? Wow. Well, she's about to move again, but this time not as far as China. She's moving to Raleigh, where our state capital is. You see, there's a church there that needs her gifts and abilities just like we do. And the bishop of the whole North Carolina conference has asked for her to go and lead that church in Raleigh. So she's going to move to Raleigh. And I'm excited for her, but I'm sad for me. Pastor Christina has become my friend. I like working with her. And I'm sad that she's moving. <laughs> Have you ever been sad? Like, you ever thought about the fact that at the end of each school year, you might not be in the same class with your friends the next year? You probably won't have the same teacher. But things tend to work out. You get a new teacher. You make some new friends. You don't really say goodbye to your old friends. They're still your friends from last year but you get to make new friends too. You have your old friends and your new friends. That's pretty cool. But still, sometimes I do get sad thinking about Pastor Christina leaving. Sometimes I think, well, maybe if I could just have what I wanted for dinner tonight, or if I got to pick the movie, that might make me feel better. Sometimes when I get sad about things that I can't control, I try to take hold of things that I can control. But it's okay to be sad. Even Jesus got sad. In fact, the Bible says Jesus cried when he got sad. So I guess it's okay to be sad. And I think it's okay to be sad that Pastor Christina's leaving. But at the same time, I happen to know something. I happen to know that we're going to get not one, but two new associate ministers who are going to come to Wrightsville. And so we're going to have the opportunity to do all kinds of new and exciting things with them. And so I get to keep my old friend and make some new ones. And that seems pretty cool. And you know why I feel like that's going to be okay? Because I'm old and I've moved 15 times in my life. That's true, 15 times. And every time I made new friends wherever I went. And I got to keep my old friends and I got to meet new ones. And I think I'm gonna be able to be able to continue to think about and remember all the great things that Pastor Christina did here at the church. And I'm also gonna be able to welcome the new people and think about all the neat things that they're going to bring to the church. And that makes me feel a little better. Will you pray with me? Almighty and everlasting God, Lord, we thank you for Pastor Christina, and we ask that you will bless her as she gets ready to move to Raleigh. Be with all of us who remain, and help us in our sadness, and help us to get ready to welcome two new associate ministers. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, grace and peace be with you. I'm so glad to be given the opportunity to give this sermon here in morning worship one last time. It is actually not my last Sunday at Wrightsville, it is my penultimate Sunday at Wrightsville. I always look for opportunities to use the word penultimate. So second to last, 
But this scripture for today is a scripture from a pastor to a church that he loves. And so I thought it would be appropriate to read um, from me, a pastor, to you, a church that I love. This is from the book of Philippians, Paul's letter to the church at Philippi from the third chapter. Hear the word of the Lord. If anyone else has reason to be confident in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day, a member of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. Yet, whatever gains I had, these I have come to regard as loss because of Christ. More than that, I regard everything as loss because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things, and I regard them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but one that comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God based on faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the sharing of his sufferings by becoming like him in his death, if somehow I may attain the resurrection of the dead. Not that I've already obtained all this or have already reached the goal, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Beloved, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but this one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the, he for the prize of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. Friends, this is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? O oh God, for this congregation and the life we share together, I give you thanks. And I pray that you would be with us now, be in my speaking and in, my li in, in our listening. And may the words of my mouth and the thoughts and meditations of all our hearts be pleasing and acceptable in your sight, O oh God, for you are our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Have you ever had one of those friends who is ready to go anywhere? I mean anywhere. This may be the friend that is equipped for every single situation. I have some friends that I like to call happy campers. It's less a group of people and more a genre of people. They often drive Subarus in my mind, but they could be Toyota Camrys or minivans or, you know, PT Cruisers. I remember being on a camping trip once and someone had the idea at the end of a rainy day. They thought, man, we could make this good meal I had one time. It had like chili beans and cornbread. If only we had a cast iron Dutch oven. And one of these happy campers said, I think I have a cast iron Dutch oven in my car. She looked at the car, she pushed aside the, you know, the boxes of books, the backpack, a couple of, you know, empty packages of Oreos, a camping tent, and there it was, a cast iron Dutch oven, just like is in the trunk of every good silver Toyota Camry. Of course, why would she not? You have to admire people who are ready to go anywhere. <laughs> I found a bag in my trunk of my car recently that had the following items in it. A Bible, my Kindle, a couple of used masks, a few cans of Coke, some exploded, some not, and an onion. Friends, I pray for all of us coming out of COVID. We are really not okay. I'm trying to imagine in what circumstance I would eat that car onion. But I have started carrying around more useful things in my car a pair of hiking shoes, a beach chair, and a pair of flip-flops just in case I wanna make a trip to the beach on my way home at the end of a long day. A sun hat, some SPF, some snacks. Paul was one of those people who was ready to go anywhere. I heard recently that some commentators think that Paul may have traveled in the first century without cars or planes or trains or automobiles 10 thousand miles. 10,000 miles. He would travel on these missionary journeys and usually spend one year in every church, helping to plant the church, helping to disciple them, to teach them about Jesus, and then 
he would be on to the next place as the Spirit led and be on his way. One of his favorite churches was the church at Philippi, which you can read in every sentence of this book. If you read back in Acts, you can find the origin stories of the church at Philippi. It's kind of a funny thing. It's a businesswoman named Lydia, a Roman jailer and his family, some other misfits that met down by the river in that city in Macedonia that became one of Paul's favorite churches. Paul was one of those people who had a pedigree. He had a resume, a CV that would stretch for miles and miles and miles. You can see it in this scripture if you read it. He talks about his history. He was born of the Jewish people of the tribe of Benjamin. He was zealous for God. He did all of the right things, all of the good things. And yet, Paul compares all of this to trash, to manure. All that stuff that I was so attached to doesn't compare at all to Jesus. All that stuff smells like the county dump. Now, Paul is using hyperbole, but he makes a real point. That stuff, all those resume items, all the way I thought before, all the people, all the person I was before, all of those ways that I thought I experienced God, they pale in the light of the face of the carpenter from Galilee. As I read these words this week and thought about looking back <laughs> to good memories, good things, and looking forward to more good things in the future, I wondered, what kind of love does it take to say that? What kind of love does it take for Paul to change from who he was? An educated Jewish Roman citizen, a righteous Jew, a person with a comfortable life probably, who wanted so badly to protect the faith from heretics that he persecuted Christians and even killed them. What kind of love does it take to change from that to someone who would travel over 10,000 miles from prisons to persecutions all over the world for his friend Jesus. As Christians, we are called to go somewhere. <laughs> I wonder if God is calling the church, not just our church, but the capital C church, the church around the world, the church universal to go somewhere. Churches have been answering that call this year. In a workshop this month, the scholar Susan Beaumont said that she estimated that some churches may have gone through technological changes during the year of COVID that would have taken 10 years, but in the past year and a half. And in her book, The Great Emergence, the author and religion professor Phyllis Tickle uses this analogy. She calls it the 500-year rummage sale, and I may have used it before, I'm sorry, but to describe changes in the church. She said this, that historically the church cleans house roughly every 500 years, holding what she calls a giant rummage sale. Now, if you could insert sound effects in here, you would put a great big record scratch because faith and church and rummage sale should not go in the same sentence unless we're having the yard sale for Rhoda Funk Hospital. But then I thought, what do you sell at a rummage sale? You sell all of those little things that are junking up your house. You don't sell the precious family albums. You don't sell the basketball signed by your favorite star or coach. You sell the little stuff, the clutter, so that all of the precious things can shine brighter. You sell the thousand Happy Meal toys and discarded heads from Lego men. You sell the George Foreman grill that someone gave you in about 1998. And so as a church, maybe God is not calling the church to sell, to get rid of those precious, beautiful things, those things that Paul writes about. But in some of the outward manifestations, right? Our hope, I imagine Paul would tell us, and not in what's behind. It's in the one who holds what is ahead. Our hope is not in the external trappings and how we do things, even if those things are good. Our hope is not in buildings or pews or music, in service times. It's not in bulletins or details. It's not necessarily even in which people are our leaders, what we wear. It's not how we worship. It is who we worship, the one for whom we are willing 
to say all of this stuff is just like garbage. Jesus gave his disciples a, um, a commission. We call it the Great Commission now. His disciples back then may have called it. What was that thing that Jesus said to us that one time before he left? He says this, Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the very end of the age. And again, in Acts 1, he was going to ascend to heaven and they were going to receive the Holy Spirit, but didn't know it. They had a question kind of about looking back at the traditions and things in the past. But Jesus focused their attention again on what was ahead, on the changes, the good changes that were to come. They said this in Acts 1, 6. The disciples gathered around Jesus and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And Jesus said to them, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Friends, they called the early Christians the way for a reason. Our hope is in a God who is always on the way, the God who calls us to go. Because we worship a God who is always leading, leading us in the days to come, sometimes as a pillar of cloud or a pillar of fire. A God who takes the dry bones of Ezekiel's valley and makes them breathe again. A God who called Peter and Andrew, James and John to come and follow, to change, to have their whole world, their whole lives turned around for something they weren't exactly sure of. We worship a God who takes the brokenness of sin and death, who came down to earth as a child, who grew up to be a man, who died and rose again, and in his rising, made us whole. We worship a God who changes people, who makes people new, marriages new, families new, communities new, organizations new, churches new, a God who makes all things new. And sometimes, like Paul, we take all of those old things that we are tempted to cling to. Sometimes they're wonderful, they're good, they're evidence of God's blessing and mercy in the past. But sometimes we are called to lay them aside, to squint ahead, to see what God is making. It's that paradox of the Christian life that God never changes and yet our understanding of him does. That Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever, but he is always calling us to change, to be transformed, to be more like him, to think outside the box, to pave new roads. We as a people are always on the road together. I'm not sure about you, but I struggle with change, even in the easiest of years. Change does not feel like a welcome thing right now, does it? Because even though we may have felt stuck at home or not going anywhere for a year now, we have been constantly shifting and moving and changing. Our plans can change from a Wednesday to a Sunday. If you're like me, you wonder, can we just have the familiar? Can we just have comfort food for a while? Can we have things the way they have always been? But then there is our friend Paul pointing us toward our friend Jesus, who was never a stay in one place kind of guy. Jesus never had a home, and maybe it wasn't because he couldn't afford one. Maybe because there was always somewhere else God was leading. Maybe it was because that he always wanted to be available, to be open to the next place God was calling him to go. Regardless, as Christians, whether we are leaving on some epic journey or staying right here, we are meant to turn on some traveling music, some songs for the road, and sing at the top of our lungs at the joy of where God is leading us. Some folks have shared with me recently, they said, you know what, you know what part I don't like about being Methodist? When your preachers leave. I thought, what a beautiful thing to say, right? Because what a gift to, be, to mourn leaving the place that you are where you have grown and been blessed, and to be excited about the place where you are going. <laughs> what a gift to mourn the person, the leaders who are leaving or have left, as Pastor Hope has, and to be excited about the people who are coming. 
What a gift to thank God for the past of the life of our church. What amazing things God has done here in this place and outside our walls, in and through the saints at Wrightsville. And what a gift it is also, a gospel gift to be excited about the places God will lead us, the people God will send us that we can't even imagine yet. It's a funny system we have where we say goodbye to folks with whom we have shared so much of life. Those intimate moments of baptisms and weddings, hospital gown finest and wedding day finest, celebrations of life. I can't think of very many other jobs where you can work for five years and feel like you have been there forever. And now our relationship is going to change. Sometimes, as a friend reminded me a few weeks ago, tears go along with that. Tears are a sign of love. And so I'm holding on for dear life to that one, along with my tube of waterproof mascara. And just as you called Pastor Hope or me with questions or for a listening ear, shared life together around dinner tables or pews, invited us into your lives, now you will call along with Pastor Doug, you'll call Pastor David and Pastor Julia. And while I'm leaving, I can't wait to hear the good news, the gospel news of the good work that Wrightsville will be doing together. In my first sermon here, I shared the story of when my friends and I drove to Wrightsville Beach to celebrate the end of a semester in seminary. I had spotted Wrightsville's sign and joked, hey, that's my future church. It was a joke we used to make when we saw a cross and flame logo in some exotic locale where we would love to live. But I was wrong, though. I thought I knew that, but I saw my future church building that day, but I didn't see my future church. <laughs> I might have seen the outward trappings, the beautiful brick space on Live Oak Drive, but I had not seen the church, the body of Christ at work here at Wrightsville. All of you watching on this video, both near and far, all of those who will gather in these pews, I was searching for a good story, a good illustration for this scripture, and I couldn't come up with one, and I realized that it was because of this, that you are the illustration. You are the vision of what it means to go, to be faithful, to move forward in those uncomfortable places sometimes, the joyous places that God is calling you to. Because I have seen the church here among you, growing and changing, living and loving, being challenged and challenging others, forgetting what is behind, straining forward to what is ahead. I have seen the United Methodist men in the kitchen cooking grits in the summer, the street turkeys crew dancing in turkey suits to glean food for hungry neighbors on Thanksgiving Eve. I have seen the glory of God and children racing to the front of the sanctuary as Kelly played Jesus Loves Me or holding hands to pray. I have seen it in the tears on Youth Sunday as a testimony made someone feel just a little bit more hopeful that God has good things for this world. I saw the church in the baked ziti made by the racial unity group for the residents at Link and in the joyful faces of Snipes Academy kids on the beach day organized by our c for c crew. I saw the church, <laughs> that glory of God in folks sandbagging our building before Hurricane Florence, moving costumes and pianos, and our children, youth and adults sharing warm meals and groceries to neighbors at Solomon Towers and the mobile home park afterward. I saw the church in Mothers-to-be at Rhoda Funk Hospital singing praise to God in the Sierra Leonean heat. I saw it in someone claiming their spiritual gifts and using them to serve. I saw it in our confirmation mentors and confirmands gathered around computer screens or in parking lots so that 23 teenagers could proclaim their faith in Jesus in this pandemic year. I saw the church in the water running down the faces of sweet children of God claimed by grace at their baptisms. I saw it in bread broken and given, the body of Christ broken for us. I saw it in loved ones holding hands around a hospital bed, praying for someone a few hours from heaven, and in love poured out in the form of punch and pimento cheese for families gathered to grieve. I didn't know then. <laughs> I knew the goodness that God had shared with me in my past, but I didn't know what was coming in the future. 
I knew the stories about Wrightsville from the past, but I didn't know how you would grow and change under the leadership of Pastor Doug, the other pastors, and our lay leaders. The way that you would go, go as Jesus had commanded us to do. And I didn't yet know all of the encouragement that I would receive through notes and emails and whispered prayers, all of the things that would see me through these first five years of pastoral ministry. And as I interviewed to be an elder in full connection, I couldn't have imagined the gathering of folks who came to Greenville, you know, exotic Greenville, North Carolina, when I was ordained. My friend said, Christina, did your church bring a literal bus? And I said, yep, that's right, Phil, there they are. I didn't see our staff who mentored me and were patient beyond belief with my mistakes and my questions. I couldn't have imagined the body of Christ that could not be stopped from worshiping in the sanctuary and on phones and around TV screens, by the water at South Channel, under the trees at Wrightsville Beach Park, back in the sanctuary again. I didn't see a hundred hard and holy conversations about the Bible and about our lives, where even if we disagreed, we refused to give up on each other. When my friends and I drove to Wrightsville on our little beach trip, I had, you know, some things that I was proud of in the past. I had no idea of what was coming in the future. I saw a beautiful brick building, but I didn't see the church. Now I have, every day for five years, and I am grateful. I came here with a couple of diplomas and too many books, but you, Wrightsville, have made me a pastor. And so as I leave to Pastor Fairmont and Raleigh, I'll be thanking my God every time I remember you. You may be moving like I am, you may not be, but God is calling you too. Jesus is calling you, calling us today to follow, not to stand still. So go, go with him. Feel the breeze on your face as you begin to walk. It feels good not to be standing still, even if you don't know quite where you're going. That feeling in the pit of your stomach, not knowing what's ahead, yes, it might be anxiety. Yes, you might feel scared to death. But isn't it exhilarating to follow after a Lord who has only good things for you, who paved a path to heaven? A Lord who says he will never leave you or forsake you and that the best days in his kingdom are always the ones that are ahead? So friends, go with him. You may need to lay down some things, your pride, your accomplishments, your expectations. You may, ne may need to lay down your attachment to the way things have been or your ideas about the way these should be. Empty your bag, have a rummage sale, leave some stuff by the curb. Your friend Jesus says that all we need is him, a pair of walking shoes and each other. Have you had one of those friends who was ready to go anywhere? He is here with you. And so maybe you can hear him today say, are you ready? Yes, you want to say. So say it, say it with your lips, say it with your life. Yes, you say to your friend Jesus, yes, we are ready. We will follow you anywhere. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
friends, I am so grateful to have been a traveler on this road with you as we have been following our Lord and our friend Jesus these past few years. I'll see you next Sunday, both here and out on Worship on the Water. But hear this blessing. This comes from the message translation of the scripture we read today. That's kind of a modern rendition. And it says this. I gave up all the inferior stuff so that I could know Christ personally, experience his resurrection power, and go all the way with him to death itself. If there was any way to get in on the resurrection from the dead, I wanted to do it. I'm not saying that I have all this together, that I have it made, but I'm on my way, reaching out for Christ, who has so wondrously reached out for me. Friends, don't get me wrong. By no means do I count myself an expert in all of this, but I've got my eye on the goal where God is beckoning us onward to Jesus. I'm off and running, and I'm not turning back. Go in peace. Go. Knowing that your friend Jesus goes with you. Amen. May the Lord